What's up, everyone, and welcome down to another episode of Zetro's Toxic Vault. And finally, punk rock has returned to the vault. And my guest today is a Bay Area legend. He has many, many bands, but I like to call the main band the mothership from Rancid, Mr. Lars Fredrickson. Hello. What's up, brother? Uh, you know, I've been reading your YouTube comments lately, so don't try to talk over me during this interview. I love that. You know what I mean? Right. I love that. That's great. <laughs> okay, so see how it says, Wadi set some rules with me, right? right? Lars set some rules. I never get that from the metal guys. Okay, I won't talk over <laughs> you. Yeah, Good I mean, to have you in. Metal guys are passive. Yeah, they are. I, they are, though. <laughs> you notice how I have to move them? Sometimes these guys, I got to get stuff out of them, but they're, you know. Well, that, I'm here to talk, bro. No, well, good. I'm going to. You know, I mean, I'm, I'm on coffee. I'm gonna keep you. I'm gonna keep you here for a while because cool. we're gonna go through it. Well, it's an honor and a privilege from, because you know I'm it, stoked. It, it is for me as well. It is for uh, again. I'm a metal guy. Everybody knows that. And, but my roots are very much punk, and we're gonna get into that. Cool. Mine's and yours as well. And uh, again, I've always said thrash metal is derivative of basically British heavy metal equals punk rock you know the yeah. aggressive and the ferocity that that it brought and the rawness of it all and the vocal content and the or the lyrical content oh, for sure very 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 much punk and well i think that those two scenes paralleled each other for a while because as you saw like a lot of those punk bands actually got more of a thrash a thrash edge like broken bones even the exploited you know bands like that so um i'm trying to think the english dogs even discharge too discharge too discharge so i mean too. i think the thrash thing you know and the punk thing it was th those worlds were were meant to at some point be together you know what i mean and i think it's not really a far stretch to be into punk rock and be into thrash metal at the same time i love thrash i, I know. you know that's my favorite kind of like metal if, right you know i love priest and i love kiss and acdc if you sure you know, motorhead I know you do. but it's just like um Thrash metal was it was like it was kind of like the first kind of metal that it was okay to like as a punk, besides Motorhead, because right. it was fast and and the lyrical content was on point. I mean, we were talking about pandemics forty years ago, weren't we? Sure, we were. And here we are. I have a song on Pleasures of Flesh, Chemical. See that you know, <laughs> you know, what, you know mean? what I mean. So, so it's it's you know again we were we I I think we like punk music was socially aware it was the first metal music that was really socially aware and would talk about stuff if you listen to a lot of megadeth lyrics I mean, yeah, they, oh, yeah. it's very that way oh yeah very political very um um kind of tongue-in-cheek about the oh, way he up. writes his yeah, yeah, yeah. his lyrics you know and there well he always had a lemmy s because uh, lemmy was very much like that. oh too. i agree i agree he's very kind of like um sarcastic yes in his in in, in his deliveries yeah. you know what i mean and, and that's what made him i think i think that's what made him him as a vocalist because you could hear the sarcasm oh sure you sure. know what i mean and i think that's what drew people to that. What do you mean? Yeah. Uh, you know, just like that. What yeah. do you mean? Who yeah. writes a song that every line starts at? <laughs> what do you mean? You know, and and it's the greatest Megadeth song there is. Yeah, I mean, you it's know what I mean. One, I yeah. it's my favorite. I love it. I love all. You know, all. I love Megadeth. But I think that that we've always had this closeness because I remember getting into punk, and and I want to get into what you what you yeah. did in the in about eighty or 8, eighty one, and I was coming from a metal. You know, I, I hard rock, heavy sure. metal. I, my father was an old biker, lived, yeah, yeah. listened to Black Sabbath, the Led yeah. Zeppelin. But then I was, I saw the Sex Pistols in 77 on TV. I didn't know the Ramones. They were the first. Yeah. 75, it was them, Dead Boys and yeah. Blondie, bands like that. And, yeah. and I didn't see it until I, I seen them. They were showing it on the, 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 um, the world news. And it's like, this is a music called punk rock and this band is called the sex pistols lead singer johnny rotten and they got johnny going yeah well, it's not as and he said something and then he goes and bass player sid vicious punches himself in the face and cuts himself <laughs> and the guy's like and i remember my old man going he's a typical biker uh sid vicious oh yeah come with some of me and my friends we'll show you how fucking vicious you are and i was like what is this and then i started paying attention to it i think more of the english stuff than american stuff yeah i mean for me it's like i know pistols weren't really it for me like, uh -huh. like that record obviously is you know classic but um for me it was the ramones you was know they, the they they seem to be more um relatable for me and i remember when rock and roll so i you know in the bay area and i don't know if it was like for you guys up here but in campbell where i'm from we had gill cable that was like the first that was when cable first started coming out and it gave instead of four channels it gave you 12 or 13 uh -huh. or something like that 
And if you ha- in Dublin here, we had to have it. Yeah. Because we couldn't get any reception. So we had cable. We had 12 channels. And channel 44 was on channel 12. Exactly. For us, right. Yeah, same Channel with us, 40 same with was us. on channel 11 yeah, 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 if you yeah, got yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah, 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 yeah. Right, right. And then, so and then if you, had, you could hit the VHS stations to find the Mexican channels. That's right. And, and channel 36 and channel 20. Right, yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly, yeah. exactly. Exactly. So, um, the but Gil Cable had, it was probably 1979, and they played Rock and Roll High School, the movie. And me and my brother, it was during the summertime, and they played it for a month, and they played it like 30, 31 times. And we saw it. Every time? Every time. We would look at the TV guide, for Christ's sake, and we would highlight it, we would underline it. We didn't, I think we didn't have highlight pens. And we watched it every single time it came on. And it's like, I, you know, it's like one of those movies that, you know, I could, you know, probably you know spill can, out verbatim i can recite every line too <laughs> yeah i know. Did, yeah so i, I like, love it i love I, it that, that movie so that was the the change and then about maybe a year later uh a guy moved into town um he was from uh pismo beach <clears throat> and he was a skinhead shaved head was wearing a white t-shirt uh you know, boots, rolled up jeans, and he was carrying a boom box and he was playing like Black Flag of the Circle Jerks. And I remember him walking down the street, his name's Sean. <clears throat> my brother and him became good friends. And then my brother was the one who sort of like always would bring the music in. So I need the first time I heard Metallica, my brother. So your brother was the introdu- your introduction to this first type time of stuff. I heard GBH, Discharge. Any of this music was through my brother, was th- who was through Sean. He was actually a writer for Zero Magazine, I believe. Or? Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. He was. Yeah. But he was he was he was he was a jack of all trades. He played in a few bands, you know what I mean. Um, but yeah, he was the one that when you uh, the, how I fucking got turned on to Exodus. He went and saw saw Exodus at Ruthie's Inn, you know what I mean, and came back and was like, "This is the band," you know what I mean. Yeah. So he was always on the cusp of like right. anything new, like that. If you wanted to know about it my brother i mean he saw metallica at the keystone yeah you know what i mean sure you know i was there so there you go we were there yeah that's but he was like he would always kind of he was one of those guys who who could go into you know different scenes or whatever and he was just a music fan so that anything that i got exposed to was definitely by him all the punk stuff and any kind of the metal stuff any kind of music really i remember hearing about uh uh, what were they called? Uh, oh fuck! What were they called? It was some kind of like blues band, uh, Dixie Dregs. Yeah, Dixie or, Dregs, Steve Morse. Yeah, yeah. I, you know, I mean, that my brother liked that, but he also would listen to fucking, you know, Kill the Lights and then fucking, you know, Pat stuff. Metheny. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> just shit like that, you know. Uh-huh. I mean? And so, and that's when I my my musical scope kind of got bigger. And then as I got older and more into my teens, of course, it got closed because. You know, I only liked, you know, if you liked metal, you liked ACDC and Motorhead, and that's all you were allowed to like, you know? As a punk. As a punk. As a punk. Because everybody knew that Motorhead was punk. Right. You know, ACDC, I mean, fuck. And Rose Tattoo. You got to give right. Rose Tattoo. There, and still, we were on tour in Germany about a year ago, and we were following Rose Tattoo around. They still do really well over there, yeah. too. Yeah. I mean, that's the, they're one of my all-time favorite bands, and... You know, I had an opportunity to become friends with Peter Wells, the, uh-huh. the slide guitar, but he actually tattooed me. Really? Yeah, he was a tattooer. And uh, we were over there, and I think it was 97 or 98, and he tattooed me. I got a nice boys don't play rock and roll tattoo from uh-huh. him at his tattoo shop. And uh, he eventually ended up dying of cancer, unfortunately. But we, we, be, we, we remained pretty good friends. And like, I actually have um, a, a, a picture of us, me and him, backstage. And I remember... Uh, he was telling me about the whole Sharpie thing because that's kind of what they fell in line to. Is that they were, it, that's, it was like a whole kind of thing over there, the scene. And it was kind of, uh, you know, it's kind of like like the punk rock thing in a lot of ways, you know? So an ACDC, it, I guess, was part of that at some point too. But um, but yeah, so any kind of music that came into my house, it, you know, if it wasn't like... My mom brought in Kenny, Kenny Rogers and, and like Engelbert Humperdinck and like her Danish drinking music. Sure. But like... And which was like oi, uh, but um, that's probably why I love that sh- that genre so much because uh, it was huge choruses, you know what I mean, 
Even though I can hear it in Holger Dance. <laughs> well, I totally hear it in Holger Dance. Well, that's the thing. It's like I feel like, you know, a lot of my influences, like that record, Holger Dansk, is like my record collection, just me, my version of presenting my record collection. I just, I love that album. Thank I you. mean, because just it's a very well rounded, aggressive record. It's got some really fun rock. You can hear the Motorhead in there. Yeah. You hear the Slayer in there a little bit. Yeah, yeah. You hear the ACDs. That's an ACDC song. You totally took ACDC, <laughs> which is, I love that though. Well, and, I, you know, for me, it's rock and roll. It's like, exactly. you know, I, it, it, if it's, and I think I've said this throughout my whole life, if it's hard and fast and it has something to say, I'm, and it's, ha- and you, you can tell a good tongue. If you're listening and your foot's tapping and you don't realize it. And and for me, I go more towards the aggressive style of music. I'm that way too. You know what I mean? And I, I want to hear loud, fast. I want to hear screeching vocals. I want to hear those things. But also like a big chorus. You know what I mean? So uh, for me, if it's hard and fast and street, it's gonna, that's what, what's going to resonate with me. Yeah, your formula works well, though, because I listen to writing from the three, you know, from obviously Bastards and Rancid and and Old From Casuals. You could tell that in your writing, you know, the, the influences that you have, because I hear in, in Rancid, I hear a lot of reggae and ska mm-hmm. in there and stuff, but I don't hear that in Old From Casuals. You know, Old From Casuals more straightforward, aggressive, like, say, Discharge or Oi Punk, you know yeah, what yeah. I mean? Like, and, and, and to me, and... And, and I and and to me that's what appeals. I like all of them, but I mean I see how you can chat. You you switch gears. You know what I mean. And 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 you do it quite well. Well, thank you. And and you know when you do it, you know what you're going for. Like you you don't just stay in one area of punk. You're not just crass or oil. Or you ska. You go all and you you take it all. And and I appreciate that as a thank as you. as a musician. And and talk about that from going from. You know, when you're writing from Rancid and then you're writing with the Bastards and then you're writing with Old From Casuals, what's your mentality as you're, as you're you know, looking? Do you, is there a certain, like, okay, I'm writing in Rancid now. So now I've got to kind of think like this or I'm writing Old From Casuals stuff so it's kind of got to be more like this and then Bastards got to be like this. You right, know what right. I mean? Is that the mentality? Well, you know, <clears throat> with the Rancid thing, it's like, the, the, you know, that's me, Matt, and Tim, and Brandon. And that's the chemistry, right? And um, I think we have, like, our thing and the way that we work it's like you don't and i'm sure you know you know anybody who's in a band for a certain amount of time it's it's like it's like telepathic it's like you don't actually have to talk to somebody to know where they're going like i know where the chord change is going to happen or where it's going to go prior to anybody explaining that's exodus right i I know what he's going to do but two two beats two measures before it comes in straight up he's going to go quarter time half you know what i mean it's it's exodus i remember one time Rancid was playing. It's when we had Brett Reed still playing drums with us. We were somewhere and we're playing a Dean off the first record. We all made the same mistake at the same time and ended the song like like 45 seconds way too early. Uh There was supposed to be another little bridge and then another thing. And we all ended and I was and I said, and I, after we stopped, I went back and everybody kind of went back because everybody kind of felt like oh, something was a little off on that one. I said, did we just end that too early? And Matt goes, yeah, I think we just ended that way too early. But it's like that's how psychically you can get connected. Right. As far as the songwriting goes, it's like uh, with, with, the, with Rancid, it's all of us. It's the four of us in a room, and basically we sit down with our guitars. And Brandon, you know, will play on a on on his uh, drum seat or, or or you know stool or whatever, and we just kind of work it out. We kind of hash it out. Okay, is this going to go here? What's this? Let's try this or whatever. So it's the four of us, and we do it very quietly before we go bring it into a very loud, you know, uh-huh. headphones and the whole thing, and just see if it's because if it works, we feel like if it works in that that with that in that dynamic, it probably is going to work in that dynamic. Sure. Right. So, and sometimes when you're blasting at a million miles an hour, it's hard to hear what everybody else is doing. And it's like, you know, the rhythm, like, you know, I mean, I try to play off a of Tim and Tim tries to play off me, but I'm always like my role when I walk in and I, and I, and, and I, and I, and I no way think of myself in the same even league or category as Malcolm Young, but I want to come in as that just hold it down play to the drums you know because if 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 me and the drums are tight 
then the basses can play off the drums and then Tim can kind of go a little bit more of a wild trip, you know what I mean? And bring that Angus thing, sure. you know, t- t- using ACDC as an example, but, um, you know. And they're all witches, by the way, every one of them. I mean, Matt's a witch, Tim's a witch. They're, they, they're like, you know. I'm lucky. I, I you know, I, I feel the same way because right. I start. I played with Skulnick and Peterson, <laughs> then it with Holt. You know what I mean? I've been very yeah. fortunate yeah. to play with good guys, yeah. you know, through my career, the Tenant Project with the Strapping Young Lad guys, you know what I mean? I've got, really got to, I've been fortunate, I think, and I was like, man, because they're all beasts, every one of them. Yeah, but, and that's the thing, it's like when you have that kind of like uh, at your disposal, and Freeman just, you know, he's, he's, he's from a different fucking planet. Like, he's the guy that can pick up any instrument in 30 days from that point, he knows it back and forth he like I'm, I'm doing a solo record right now it's it's kind of like an it's not so much acoustic it's more like a billy bragg kind of thing and i had him play some mandolin on it and he's just he's a mandolin player but he can play bass like nobody's business i'm telling you you know because i was listening to a few rancid albums over the last couple of days and um god his chops are just no he's he's i mean Lars, he talk about bringing up the bottom end. You know, he's a great white shark coming out of the water, dude. He's like, man, it's just his musicianship. It's just right. You know what I mean? No, it's like he's hey, the best he's too, though. I'm yeah, 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 yeah. You don't but but Matt, Matt is the probably the best musician in Rancid. Uh-huh. You know, and I think that you know, as songwriters, you know, we all kind of, um, you know, uh, how do we? How do I say? It? we sort of compliment each other because, you know, going out and Tim, you know, did the transplants and Matt did Delvo's brigade. And then I did the bastards and we all kind of got a different perspective because the bastards was close to rancid, but it was a different style. And, but it was more of my personality in the music. And when I went to that, you know, I was the only guitar player on that first record. So it's, it's kind of like I had to kind of think about, okay, so what was the other guitar player going to do to compliment the rhythm guitar player. So I had to start thinking in a bigger scope, right? And then, so when those songs were written, me and Tim, you know, wrote those songs together. And um, then when the casuals came along, you know, I wanted to keep it a three piece at first because I just thought it would be easier to deal with. I didn't know. I Honestly, when that band first started, um, I met Casey and then Casey introduced me to Paul and I basically said, and, and we ended up going to some place in uh, some fucking place like in Martinez or something. And the guy, it was like a, it was an by the hour rehearsal studio. And, and it was an old dude. He must've been, I swear to God, 90 years old. And his name was Bob Dylan. Okay. And we and, spelt the same way. Yeah. By 100%. And we were playing and we were writing kind of our first songs and Bob, 90 year old Bob was on a fucking like, 15 foot ladder trying to change a ceiling light and we were just kind of like watching him because it's like he's teetering he's he's not it's not like he's a young man here i don't know what happened to bob hopefully he's well i guess he didn't fall huh no but he would be 100 now but um but you know and i just remember those times but when i had when i when i went into that i had to like okay these songs have to be written for a three-piece so it's not about lead guitars anymore. Now it's like if the the leads got to kind of match. Because what I always fucking hated is like when you had like a four piece band, guitar, bass, singer, drummer, and the, you know you would you know the the bass player would be holding down the four, you know, doing the the roots during the solo, and the solo would just be all it just it would just be like this mosh. and it's it didn't make sense with the song. It would just be like oh that's the solo break, you know what I mean? And so I had to kind of come out as like, okay, what can I do as far as like a lead player to kind of make it sound like a rhythm guitar and a lead at the same time? Does that make sense? Sure. And so, but my, but then, you know, so that was another challenge. Like, how am I going to write, you know, these songs to match just so three people can go up on the stage and what you hear on the record is what you get on the stage. That was important to me. Right. And important to us as a band. So I had to start writing like that. But then as we, you know, three months later, because I remember when I initially talked to him, I said, listen, let's just go play a few shows, just have some fun. And who knows what's going to happen. We'll probably just fade away into obscurity, but we're just going to go have some fun. About three months later, 
I said, we got to get together because then, then all of a sudden, like, you know, you know, a record label wanted to get involved and we were getting offering sh- uh, offered shows out the door. And I was like, okay, this is something that I never expected it to be. What do you guys want to do? Because we have an opportunity here. We can either just fucking fade into obscurity. Put, we had put out, our seven inch was about to come out or we hadn't had a, actually found a home yet. The label had come in and said, we'll put it out. And I said, this is our opportunities, right? What do you guys want to do? And they were like, well, let's, let's give it a shot. And so that's how basically we met in Casey's backyard in Oakland. And I said, well, what do you guys want to do? Let's give it a shot. But as time- What year was this, Lars? This year? was 2000, 2010. 2010. 2010, because yeah, we'll be 10 years next year. Uh-huh. Or this is it this year? Yeah, 20. Yeah. Fuck. I know. It flies, doesn't it? Oh, my God. It just flies. Oh, my God. It just flies. Yeah. So, but then then when we, when, when we, so we put out like, like 15, seven inches in a matter of a year. Uh-huh. We were just so prolific. It's like every other week, we, I felt like we were in the studio because I was just coming up with stuff. Like, it, uh, like I, I tapped into a source. I was doing everything that I could, you know, and I was just going, I was keeping it. Like okay, a three piece, and then when we when we sat down to do this means war, I was like, okay, we had talked about getting another guitar player, and um, and I, we, the Gabe who plays with us now was playing in a band called the Sydney Ducks, and he'd been around the scene forever, uh-huh. <clears throat> and he know he you know he 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 yeah, I think he played in a few thrash bands, he played in a lot of punk bands. He was on a band that was on SST for uh, forget what they're called, but um, and he'd done some touring. And so as I, as we were kind of writing that record and the songs were kind of, you know, I, one of the things I learned in Rancid is that if a song starts taking shape, you don't get in the way. You let, you kind of let it become what it's going to, you throw the kit, we say, throw the kitchen sink at it, see what sticks, whatever falls by the wayside. You know, you can put, we try all of our songs when Rancid, like if we come up with the riff, we'll try it like a ska way We'll try it like a fast punk way. We'll try it mid tempo. We'll try it. We'll try it all different ways. We, I, I feel like we, we. It's, it's like that's how you sort of see where it can be. What, what's best suited. Also for creates it. hills and valleys. Right, and also it keeps your 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 mind working. Sure. And gives you, and sometimes a beautiful mistake happens. Right. Sure. And, and, and fucking a lot of rancid songs are beautiful mistakes. Toxic Waltz is the biggest. See, there you go. The biggest mistake. I wrote the lyrics as a joke. I literally, (laughs) those lyrics were written in like 25 minutes. And all I did was I took a parody of a 50s dance song and just jotted it down. And then I came to win the studio the next day. And I go, hey, dude. I told Gary, I go, I just wrote these last night. They're kind of funny. I go, it's just totally silly. People won't take it seriously if we, we, you know, record this. I just want to do it for fun. And he reads them. He goes. These are actually fucking brilliant. I'm like, really, dude? I go flailing around. I go, so don't be a dunce and dance like a runt. It's kind of like, and <laughs> it's punk, dude. It's the biggest fucking song that Exodus had every night. That's what they want to hear. It talks. So I understand. Yeah. Making mistakes and going, whoa. Yeah. Tapped into something. Yeah, here. yeah, yeah. But that and that's that's part of the process too. You know. It sure it is. And also we also have a rule that I, I you know I tick into everything that I do is like, there's no bad ideas. You try everything. If somebody says, hey, let's go A instead of the fucking, you know, F. Okay, let's try it. Go through it. Ah, I don't know. And sometimes even the one who suggests the change it goes, ah, no, no, no. Let's keep it to the F or whatever. But you, ha- I think you got to kind of experiment like that in those environments because that's that's when to do it. And Rancid, we go into the studio and we're pretty fucking quick. We don't spend months. We go in for five days and we bang out a record. Uh-huh. And then maybe we take another five days and tighten shit up, and then that's it. And so it's ten days total spent on a record, maybe, and then maybe another ten days to mix it. So it's like it's very quick, and that's the way the casuals were. We would go in, bang it all out. We wouldn't rehearse before. I like to. I actually like going into a studio and seeing what comes from it. You know what I mean? Because like like sometimes the beautiful mistakes happen there. You know what I mean? Because if you so rehearsed and you go in. I'm, that's that, that works on some levels for people. For me, we don't ever do it that way. Exodus does not do it that way. It's uh, you know everybody knows it. Gary and Tom are up in you know North writing the music right now, and then we'll go in in September to start recording the record. And obviously, drums will come first. But you know, uh, 
you know, once rhythm guitars go down, it's all open. I'll do vocals one day, and then the bass will come in. I'm, we're actually going to re all record together up there. That's right. Which is going to be great, which we haven't done. When I did Blood and Blood Out, Gary was in Europe with Slayer, and I did it with Jack, and, you know, it was this is going to be a full band thing. And I got all excited when I found out. We mean we're all going to be up there together, all five of us? How great is that? <laughs> you know, I, I think you really... That band, that bonding is so important for Straight that up. to make them to, to make the product be the band. If it's Exodus, it's those five guys that are up there and they're grinding and they're working each other and telling each other, "Nah, man, try this," or "No, dude, I heard this. Try it." Like you know what I mean? And well, that's, uh, that's, yeah. I mean, if you think of the best, I, I know for me personally, the best records I've ever been a part of, we've all been in that room. You know what I mean? At the same time, that's the way Rancid does it. We, you know, we're all in the same room with the drums, headphones. You know, obviously you're 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 isolated or whatever your amps are, but it's the energy, and it's like you don't you don't do the thing for us. We'll do a song three times. So you record live then? You one hundred percent. Really? That's what we've always done. I love that. We've never done that. We've never done a lot going on with what we're well, doing. Yeah, but, as well. but there is a we've lot going on. Done, I mean, we've never done that. I think for us. And I and I brought this with the casuals and and with the bastards too. It's more of that um, uh, that 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 unsure, the desperation, the the uh, how would you say it? The um, the it's like it's like intimacy, but you're unsure of it. You know, it's like it's like it's like trying to get laid for the first time. Like you really want to go do it, but you just don't really know how to approach it. Like. Does my shirt come off first or does my right, pants? Right. You know what I mean? Right. It's like, you know, I know I'm hard. I know. You know what I mean? <laughs> I know that I got to put that into that, but but it's the process. The mechanics of, of getting yeah, yeah, there. You yeah. know what I mean? Is, is oh, this going to be okay? What a great analogy. You know what I mean? What's my mom going to think? Yeah, exactly. You know, I don't wow. know, maybe not. Maybe not. But, um, you know, my point is, is that it's, it's, it's each time, it, you know, when you get that urgency, urgency. Uh, that to me is like in punk in punk music, at least the kind that I that I'm been a part of. I think the urgency is the most important. If it gets too flat, it starts to sound like a glazed donut, and you can hear it a lot in music that comes out these days. You know, when you, I listen to some of these, the, like the you know, sometimes I'll listen to that metal station on Sirius, and every single fucking band sounds. It sounds like oh, this is what you do. To get this, and then there's you got your standouts. Yes, you know, like like your Lamb of Gods. Yes, in, in, your, in bands I, like I that. know that, I and I feel the same way about that. Metal. To me, sounds urgent. That yes. to me sounds real. That right. to me sounds authentic. Sure. I'm not, and it's just, and then you got the parts where I'm gonna sing like this, and then I'm gonna scream like I, you know, I'm not getting no, my way. It's just I'm, like I'm not. Yes, come on, I get you know, it. I get it. just stop. I know. Just stop. Go get your fucking green apple lollipop and go sit in the corner. I don't want to hear your whining and how, you know, it sounds like whiny. Yeah. No, there's no, there's just no room for whining in metal or punk. No, no, there no. isn't. There isn't. But anyways, I, I'm, gotta I'm be sorry I've taken that's inventory. You, that's, you can take inventory <laughs> here on the ball. We want to know that stuff. I mean. Well, but that, that to me makes it sound stale. So I, I don't really, you know, I'm not going to mention band names. I'm not really that type of guy. But there's a few that come to my mind when I think about bands like that. And it just, it just, it just sounds, it doesn't sound real. It sounds, it sounds... Uh, they, well, it sounds like you know they took a formula from this, yep. they took a formula from this, yep. and they took this formula, and then they went went like that and yep. put it all together. I have the same opinion on some of these, but especially I our first album came out in 1985, so we've been around a long yeah, time. Yeah, yeah. So I've seen them come and go, you know, yeah. and, and that's the thing too. They, I've seen bands, Lars, that I was, you know. On the mid bill, on the you know the big, and then they and then I've been on the same festival right in the mid bill, and they're back on the bottom yeah, again. Yeah, you know yeah, what yeah. I mean? Because I, I, if if they maybe had a, a certain time of crowd, I mean we were um, you know it just I've seen it all that that has come through, you know, and then that type of thing happens. People know if it's genuine yeah, or not. Yeah, yeah. They well, know that, if you're real. They well, that's the thing. I, my filter is my twelve year old. Because like they're gonna, they're the ones that are gonna figure oh, it I out. I know, and they'll tell you too. Yeah. So it's like what they're jamming is like you know 
Well, first of all, my twelve year old's a full. Yours are metalheads too, straight right? up. It's just they stri- don't do punk at all. They like punk, but metal. I'm mean, Wolfgang. He's he's Exodus, Slayer, Lamb of God. You know, fucking Overkill. Right. You know, Creator. Creator, love Creator. Yeah, fucking Creator rules. Yeah, I love Creator. But but you know, he, he likes that kind of of jam. But I'll play him some other stuff, like some of the stuff. I go, what do you think about this? And he goes, Nah, yeah, he's all right. It's just not, yeah, you know, you know, whatever. So, right. you know. And that and that's how I can kind of tell what's good and what's not good. So like I, you know, a lot of those casual songs. My my eight year old, he's eight year now, but he's a drummer. Right. So I would go down in in our little got a little yeah, back so you room. Yeah, jam with them. Every yeah, yeah, yeah. You put it on. And I would and I would great. yeah and I would put the riff. I go okay. What are you gonna do to this? And and my eight year old would help me realize some of these like Thunderbolt. I when I came up with that riff. Um, I said, you need to, you need to come downstairs. I got this riff. I want you to play to this riff. And he goes, well, what's it like? And I said, just imagine like kind of mid tempo thrash is what I say to him. And he goes, okay, kind of, okay. I think I know what you mean. So, and he was like, what, six at the time. And so I go, and he starts going, and it just like, he, and then it boom, 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 you know, like the, he, the whole thing. And I was like, wow, this kid's got an instinct, right? And he ended up naming that song, but it was funny because after we did the, we recorded it. Uh, he, I said, "Hey, Soren, check it out." You know, we did the song that me and you did, and it didn't have a title then. And he, and he's like, and he's listening to it, and he goes, "Oh, Paul did my drum beat." I see. And I was like, "Yeah, Paul did your drum beat." So he was really stoked that, like, you know, he that could, he that he well, that's the groove that yeah, was there, though. Yeah, yeah, but it was it was genuine. Because, like you said, you took him down there. This is a kid who doesn't have a Rolodex of music in his head. Correct. What grabs you? What is the thing that grabbed you? You know, as what did you hear as this kid? You know, yeah. And that's what he did. He exactly. played what he heard behind the rhythm yep. in what he's related to from what he listens to. Correct. You know what I mean? Yeah, so yeah. it all the mechanics of that's great. Now you know mine are in hatred as well. Mine sure. play, my kids play. Yeah, yeah. As well. I think that that's awesome that um They're a good band too. Yeah, they are they're, they're I like them. They wanted to be they're very talented like that. And they, especially the main guitar the guy who writes everything because yeah. the kids a witch. And so it just took years of, you know, listening to dad going, you know, hey man, if you want to be at this level, like to Nick your feet got to go a little quicker. Because <laughs> Joey Jordison was from Slipknot was his guy. He loved. Right, right. And that was when Nick was nine. Was like when Slipknot started coming out. Yeah, yeah. Nick's twenty. Going to be twenty seven this year. Wow. And he was like, yeah, wow. how it fly? It goes quick, Lars. Yeah, I know. I'm telling. T- I know. I know. My I know. oldest is thirty. Well, I'm. Just, it's like I'm thinking like you know where I'm at now. It's just it's so strange, you know, because when I think about the first time I heard music and it was Kiss. And I was okay. Four. And those, how old are you now? Because you were born in seventy one. Correct. So you're five, four or five, four or five. So yeah, it was at and Kurt, that's in their heyday then. It, yes, it was at Kurt Heindel's house. I remember it's my one of my brother's friends. He had Kiss posters all over his wall. I remember I had to sleep in his bed on a sleepover, and Gene Simmons' "Spitting Blood" was the poster above my head, and I was so scared. And they were watching Creature Features in the next room. Nice. And uh, I was like, fucking. It was it was so gnarly. It scared the shit out of me. It scared the shit out of me. But it was like one of those things. It was like you know, it's like the car crash. You don't want to look, but you have to. Oh God. So and then once yes. I started kind of feeling that, and I you know, and then when we went to Denmark, when my mom and dad split up, my cousin was into like Slade and like uh, well, who were they called? Oh, was it Slade? Uh, Sweet. Uh, he just passed. Mabel. Yeah. yeah. He just passed. Mabel was a band, Chicory, Chicory Tip or something like that. It was like a lot of that kind of like boot boy kind of shit. Gary Glitter? Yeah, shit like that. <laughs> you know, just the big boot boy stuff. Yeah, sure. And, and, then you, and now when I look back, I saw what Kiss was doing. Uh-huh. They were taking that boot boy big, big, big thing. You know, because if you listen to those drums, you know what I mean? They're, they're, I mean, Peter's holding it down, but it's also a different approach. Sure. But it sounds massive. Yes, it does. And then Ace... Like that was my first guitar guy. Uh huh. That's why I wanted to play Les Paul. 
That's why, I mean, that was my dude. Like, you can hear me rip. I mean, you listen to a Rancid record, you, pff, you're hearing Lars Fredrickson trying to do Ace Freely. Really? That's straight up what it is. I mean, that you know, it's straight up what it is. I mean, and Jake Burns and, you know, from Stiff Little Fingers, that was a big influence. And But the rhythm guy was always Malcolm because he was the best. He's so probably, Malcolm and Ace are your kings. Right? 100%. Them, that, 100%. That, and you put them boom, boom like that. Yes, I put Malcolm a little higher than Ace. But Lemmy above everybody. Everybody. 50, 51% Lemmy, 49%. It says right there. <laughs> yeah. 49% motherfucker, yeah, 51%, 51 percent son, son of a bitch. bitch. Yep. Yeah. No, but so Lem, Lemmy, you know, not only being able to like ha actually spend time with that guy. Us too. I've been very, I was very fortunate to you know, spend time with Lemmy. And just to talk about, I remember one time we talked... Because all you had to do is either tell a joke, talk about history, or talk about rock and roll. That's he loved history. His dude was the biggest. He tell you shit about World War Two and World War One, and straight didn't up, even know straight up. No, yeah. I mean he was he was he was very special, and he always treated me. And I think he knew how big of a fan I was, you know. And but he would he was like one of those guys who who would like give me the backstory about certain things Motorhead that I never read in an interview. Or whatever, but like you know, and he always made it like free to like, hey, you know that photo shoot of Ace of Spades, and he's like, oh man, I got a story like, you know, the the, the one reason why Fast Eddie or whatever is wearing one side, the shoe it was a shoelace that was holding up his leather jeans because they split or something like that, and then he fell on his ass down the hill because I guess that was done in outside uh on a uh, on a construction site it looks like the desert right but it was like in this place uh in wigan where uh where it was like a, a it was at a construction site and i think that they just not photoshopped but that blue sky that's behind them uh -huh. it was like cut out it you had know? to be because there's never blue sky in, in, in england oh yeah there's right no goddamn way that's yeah said, england come, come for the food the stay for the weather exactly exactly <laughs> you know that you're 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 a fish and chips guy. See, every time you're over there, I see all no, the listen, restaurants. I'm such out. a fucking anglophile. Like you, anything, you are. You you are. Uh, you really you, are, you, are, you, you really should am. go over there. You are England. Like well, you, you, I you think feel at home over there well, when you're I there. Do, I, I do. know you do. I think it's because the Danes were over there for so many hundreds you, you of years. Think so? You know, because, I mean, you know, just, we've conquered and fucked them all up for I know, so many I, years. It's 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 funny because I watch. You know, I follow you on socials, and that when you're over there on tour and stuff, and I see that, you know, I'm like, God, this dude just fits. He is right in. No. I, when I'm fish and chips in Brighton. <laughs> well, that's what I mean. I, when I was 19, I joined the UK Subs, which was you know a, a yeah. you know, pretty well known punk band. They were, and um, you know probably one of the first kind of wave 70s. And I think being at that age, going over there, and I, you know I'm a kid from Campbell, California. Sure. You know it's kind of like San Jose, Dublin. I know I'm a you, kid from Dublin. Yeah, you know I mean We're, we we kind of have an attitude. You know what I mean? We're we're a little bit rougher. We're very rough around. We're not as refined as people from San Francisco right. or Berkeley. No, no, we are not refined. We're, no, we are not. We are, we are a little bit. We're, we're rough around the edges. You know what I mean? That's well, why they moved us out. Of, my parents moved everybody out of the out of the city into the suburbs because they were just like, you know, wait, no, no, no. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so how it is. Yeah. So my my thing was like, you know, where I grew up, you know, my, it's low income housing and. I always was sort of a um, a wild animal in a lot of ways, you know? And when I went over to England for the first time, I'm 19, 18, 19 years old. I'm playing in like one of my all-time favorite bands with guys who are old enough to be my dad, right? And I learned a lot. So they start, when that band started, I was five. Yeah. And yeah. so now I'm in the band, you know, which is, you know, so sort of bizarre. You know, for me, and you know, as a young kid, you know, I think the culture I just absorbed it all. You know, and plus I was into it prior. Cause the records, the music that I was into, like a lot of the the, you know, a lot of the English punk is what I think resonated with me, like GBH and Discharge, Exploited, and then you had the oi bands like The Last Resort and The Business and Blitz, Foreskins, and you know the Some whole. Humans. Yeah, and the whole punk and skinhead thing before the skinhead thing sort of got like, you know, got more attached to the right wing Nazi bullshit, which is right. not, it's not what that's about. It no, started it with Jamaican culture in the 60s, you know, and um, the whole style comes from, from you know, the, um, the black kids that were living in England that were from Jamaica, you know, so 
it's like for me when the oi music happened and you saw the punks and the skinheads coexisting i never really you know i wasn't smart enough i was 11 years old when i and 10 years old when i saw these things i never made the distinction that there was a difference right it, to me it just seemed like you could be punk you could be a skinhead but you were all part of this one thing right. you know and that's the one thing that i found in the punk rock community and why why I gravitated to that music is because it was about inclusiveness by, you know, if you were a weirdo or you couldn't find your place to fit in, this is a place where you could do it. And nobody cared. And nobody gave a shit. Bad, skinny, it, it, ugly, dude, it didn't matter if you were care, gay, right? straight, yes, male, right. female, right. black, white. Sure. I mean, I grew up in, a, you know, we were like one of the only white families in my neighborhood. And it's like the one commonality that we all had is we were fucking poor. Right. It didn't matter the color of your skin. I didn't see race until I actually left my hometown. Uh-huh. That's when it was like, oh, somebody you know said something, some comments or whatever, and you're like, whoa, that's you know, that's the first time I ever sort of understood that the com- complexities of that. You know what I mean? And I saw you know, and then later on, your eyes kind of get open and you see you know these things. But to me, like, um, you know, just being part of something. You know, and like it was so inclusive. Like I said, it didn't matter what color you were. It didn't matter what, you know, if you wanted to believe. It didn't matter. It just didn't matter. You know, none of that bullshit mattered. It was like it was outside of society. We were our own thing. You know, it's kind of like, you know, any kind of subculture in the music, whether it be the yeah, thrash metal, thing. Yeah, thrash was the same it, way. We were, exactly. we were this sector of bands and we all identified with it. We were all guys who liked punk rock as well as liking Iron Maiden and Saxon yeah. and Motorhead yeah. and, the, and the Scorpions yeah. and Richie Blackmore and people like that. Yeah. So it was kind of... Well, I remember uh, seeing Cliff Burton wearing a fucking Misfits t-shirt or Hetfield wearing a GBH t-shirt right. or, you know, whatever, fucking uh, your boy uh, wearing the Broken Bones t-shirt. Sure, sure. You know, I forget his name, the other guitar player. Rick. Rick. God Rick. damn. Sick Sorry, Rick. Rick. But, I mean, he would. I saw him in a Broken Bones t-shirt. Sure. I was like, okay. Killing Joke? Yeah. I got a poster in there. He's in my house. A poster frame. He's wearing a Killing Joke shirt. Yeah, I mean, but that's... I got Corrosion of Conformity on in the same thing. It's like it's like we identified with the aggressiveness, the rawness, the um, the socialism yeah. of it, the social well, awareness the social, of yeah, it. Yeah, it's, it's like very a social aware. Yeah. I mean, if you wanted to go to listen to um, something that's real, listen to a thrash metal song. They're not going to write about how pretty the girl is and how, you know, we want to go and get laid. We didn't write any about that. No, 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 but that's the thing. You you know, the Bay Area at that time when the punk was heavy and the thrash started happening, I mean, there was desperate times around here. I agree. I mean, it was Reagan era, Yes. fucking joblessness sure. you know economics voodoo economics <laughs> man i mean I, I i think we it was like a couple million people were unemployed sure. in, the, in the bay area so it wasn't like it was like an easy place to to get along you know it's not like it is now you got silicon valley and everybody every tech nerd's a millionaire right you know what i mean it wasn't like that no, at all <laughs> quite the fucking polar opposite no, exactly it was i mean where i grew up and i know in like berkeley oakland and the San Francisco, those were some pretty gnarly places. Oh, the Omni, the Omni was like, that was dude, a, a, could be once a, you got in was a great, yeah. great, great club. When you came out, dude, that, watch your back, watch your fucking back. I, I mean, that place was in the middle of gnarly the trouble area. That was fifty first, the fifty first and Telegraph. Yeah, right, exactly. I mean, the trenches back in the day. The trenches, it was right because I remember we used to go to was it that, was it, was that Italian deli right there? It's closed down now. It doesn't matter. Luca? But, no. Was it Luca? No, it was. Uh, because Flint's was right down the street. Correct. Remember Flint's? Flint's Barbecue. Flint's was right down the street. And we used to go to Flint's at 2 in the morning and wait in a line with, you know, all the bar crowd was out there. And, you know, and you know, yeah. we were like these white heavy metal kids in a line of, you know, all these older black guys and black ladies that have just left from, you know, dancing or whatever like that. And we'd walk and they'd like, like what's up, baby? What you want? And we'd be like, um, I'd like to get a, a, the large ribs, please. And like... Um, how would you like your sauce? It'd be like hot. So I remember later looking at me go, burn your white tongue off. <laughs> I go, really? It's hot. It's a, and it, you had the bread to scoop it up. Yeah. And it was cool. It was, a, it was, but it was very. No, it was ghetto. tense. It was very tense. But I mean, and that's the thing. And that's like when I said, when I started kind of figuring out like kind of the really, you know, the way it wasn't, it wasn't just this. This. What happened in Campbell is not how the rest of the world, this same Absolutely. thing here in Dublin. What happened here in Dublin was that once we went over the hill, 
was a whole new world. It was a whole different world. We're going to take a break here. We'll be back with Lars Fredrickson real quick. Thank you.